Good afternoon, everyone. Hopefully we can, after all that heavy-duty science, we can, we can uh, bring it together and answer some of the questions and dumb it down a little bit so we make some sense out of all this. Um, I'm going to start off by giving a little bit of history on where we're at with this whole new movement on ecological agriculture and just what it's all about. Um, and hopefully answer some of the questions that didn't get answered earlier in, in some of my slides. I uh, just want to start off by um, talking about where we're going and, and what, what is basically the new move in agriculture, and it's called the Evergreen Revolution. And I'm going to give you a little bit of history on where that, where that came from and where that's going and, and why we're focused this way and, and the way, why we call that this. So when we look at um, where this came from and where we came from, we're talking about uh, more sustainable agriculture and where we're going, trying to get back to healthier soils, healthier food, and the whole focus today is on nutrient density. Growing a crop that is full of nutrition and basically um, is, is valuable food when we eat it. So that's kind of where we're at and getting back to some of these basics and understanding this relationship between plant and animal. So obviously we need, uh, we need good productive land and that's an issue because we're getting pushed off of productive land as we populate the regions we originally settled in and we have to now do a better job with poorer land and, and less of it. So it's becoming an issue and a struggle to maintain these healthy soils. Seeds is always an issue and then we talk about nutrient density and uh, Dr. White alluded to it a little bit when he showed the difference between um, some of these seed that he was working with with the endophytes a healthy seed, a nutrient-rich seed, will have more endophytes. A healthy seed, a nutrient-rich seed, will have more vigor and obviously more yield. So again, we need to pay attention right at the start of the seeds. And, and you know, that was also mentioned by George in his little comment about what we've done to the seeds that we grow. We have basically destroyed the genetics by not paying attention to some of these relationships with the soil. And we've bred out that phenotypic relationship with these organisms. And, and what we're trying to do now is, is get back to that and, and help the plant uh, reestablish some of this phenotypic relationship. We need good water. We want to keep as much of the fertilizer available to, to, to us today. And that's an issue because of the declining reserves worldwide on, on particularly phosphates. Um, our plants are only functioning at a 40% efficiency and nutrient use efficiency. And George and I, when we started this company, we thought, you know, if we could just make a difference with some of these biologicals and stimulate a 5% increase in nutrient use efficiency. That's huge on, on, on the impact we have on world demand and yield supply for fertilizers. And again, we want to look and we want to maintain all the, all the tools in our toolbox for weed control and, and insect and, and disease control. So it's all about growing a healthier food um, uh, on this planet and lots of it. And that's kind of where we have to get to uh, with, with production agriculture and the directions we're going. So let's look at where we've evolved from, <clears throat> talking about the first green revolution, and that was back in the 1800s, when the Peruvians found the value in uh, bird guano, and they started excavating this stuff and using it for fertilizer, and found out that this stuff really made a difference. But again, they overdid things, and pretty soon they were just about out of, out of that reserve, and it had to be regulated. So again, here's, a, here's a, an example of exhausting a very valuable reserve and not paying attention to uh, how to replace it. The second green revolution was really based on the, the invention or patent of nitrogen manufacturing, a uh, few other things like uh, difference in straw strength and some of the breeding technology in straws, uh, increased use of fertilizers, we had the introduction of uh, agrochemicals, so a whole bunch of things uh, came into the play here to increase our efficiency in producing these crops that we, that we do today. It wasn't until about, I think it was mentioned already, 2012, but 2013, that uh, this individual here coined the phrase the evergreen revolution. And that's kind of the direction we're going today with this whole understanding of microbial uh, synergies with plants and, and, and cropping systems. So the things we can do and what, what can we do and where do we go? Well, I already mentioned the increasing uh, need for uh, food because of the populations and the shrinking land. Diets are changing. Worldwide, people want to eat a better food. Uh, they're always looking for a lot of cases where they didn't have a source of meat. They want to be meat eaters like, uh, like I am. Uh, so a bigger demand for higher value foods. And then again, there's a lot of interest no matter what you're eating for better quality of food or this nutrient density. So where we're going or where we need to go is this whole movement towards ecological agriculture and, and just move towards more sustainable agriculture to reduce 
the dependence on these fossil fuels and just, again, a better quality food worldwide. So what that whole statement here is, and this is a, a phrase by George himself, ecological agriculture practice that requires greater reliance on natural soil processes, native microorganisms, and the interactions between plants, animals, and humans. Uh, that's what soil health is. And we kind of lose focus of that definition. You know, some people look at it as tilth and aggregate stability, um, microbial activity, all the above, but basically it's, it's everything encompassed in soil health. So we look at, you know, how does this play and, and how does it look as ecological agriculture? Well, uh, we've had rhizobia for a long time. This is an ecological um, means of producing nitrogen in legumes. Uh, so that's been around for quite some time. Um, reference is already made to this Brazilian sugar cane industry and the use of endophytic bacteria for nitrogen fixation and the work they did in their breeding program to select for varieties that were uh, more sustainable and could grow in lands that were maybe less, um, less quality, less access to things like fertilizer. <clears throat> and then just going forward, developing soils that have microorganism populations that enhance growth. In other words, looking for that disease suppressive soil and looking for that that relationship with these microbes that, that helps the plant naturally take up nutrients and, and mine some of these reserves. So we look at rhizobia fixation. They've been around a long time. Um, much of this, this is Canadian technology, and it's, 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 it's been successful. And again, we're looking at and trying to maintain that phenotypic relationship that plants have um, with this organism. And it's been quite successful, and I think uh, there's what is it, 50% of nitrogen on the planet for crops is coming from rhizobia fixation, George? Is that your... your uh, it's more. more than that? So it's, it's significant. So biological uh, relationships is, is, is really something that can really help us going forward. When we talk about rhizobium, uh, there's a number of different rhizobium. And again, we're trying to, we're trying to find the rhizobium that has the, the best or fixes nitrogen the best and has a phenotypic relationship with the plant so the plant can actually find this organism. There's all kinds of rhizobium in the soil, some that don't do as good a job. And this is something we need to focus on in what we're trying to do. We can inoculate with the best, but if we do not have the right nutrition in place to help this plant actually find that rhizobium, it still might pick up some of these cheaters. It still might not pick, it still might not pick up the most aggressive and the most uh, efficient rhizobium. So there's things that are happening to, between the plant. I hope to answer some of those questions here in some of these slides with the things that we've done. Um, this is one of those things that we've completely missed in production agriculture, and that's the importance of boron. And what boron does for a legume. First of all, <clears throat> the sugars that the plant needs to create the signal to go out and find <clears throat> that particular rhizobium comes through boron nutrition. Then the plant also has to maintain certain levels of boron within the plant to maintain a signal within the plant so that the plant, as Soledad said earlier, the plant can recognize the rhizobium as a friendly bacteria, not a pathogen, so it won't kill it. <coughs> Excuse me. How many people in here have walked a field in August and pulled up soybean plants and, and squeezed the nodules and they're just dust? Show of hands? That's because in August we have dry weather Boron is taken up by the plant through respiration, and regardless of how much you have in the soil, you're likely to get boron deficient in the soybean plant, and the plant's going to lose its ability to recognize that, that rhizobia that's been there up until that point in time as a friendly, and it kills it, and that, that's what's happening. So we really got to pay attention to this relationship, and I'm going to share with you some of the work that we've done in recognizing how these different nutrients help build the proper compounds for plants to produce, a, produce a chemicals and compounds and carbons that feed these things, these microbes. And as Dr. White said, the plant is cultivating these organisms. And how it's doing that is it's doing that through rich carbon sources that it redistributes in the rhizosphere to feed these organisms. It's more of the same. So this is his Brazilian work, and again, they focused on a breeding program that was, that was based on using little nitrogen or having nitrogen-fixing bacteria within those plants, and they had their whole breeding program uh, based on that. Um, so understanding that all plants have phenotypic relationships with these organisms, and we've bred that out, uh, these individuals went back and found the more indigenous plant uh, varieties and bred that back into the program. And we're really going to have to start thinking that way in production agriculture today to get back to that point. 
Significance here in Brazil, they're using about 50 kilograms per hectare of nitrogen to grow the same crop as the rest of these countries that use anywhere from you know, 200 to 400 pounds of nitrogen to grow sugarcane. The other thing too is the sugarcane coming from these, these, this Brazilian work contains endophytes. And many of you have been exposed to people uh, using molasses for control of diseases and spraying it foliar on plants and, and stimulating growth. Um, and some people have success and some people don't. Well, if the molasses was made from the Brazilian sugarcane, you likely had success because the endophytes are in the molasses. If it was made from other sources of sugarcane, probably not so much. So we've known for a long time that there's something different between the rhizosphere and the bulk soil. So this individual found in 1903 that there was a significant difference in what this rhizosphere contained as far as microbes and what was contained in the bulk soil. So how was this plant changing the population of these organisms in that rhizosphere and, and making that difference? We've known that a long time. So it's really only been since 19 or 2012 that we've really started paying attention to this. So you know, what is the difference and how are they getting there? So how is a plant basically changing that, that microbial population? And, and that's really for the last 10 years what we've been focused on. Another thing people lose sight of is, because we hear this all the time, where can I get a carbon source to feed my microbes? Uh, what is the best carbon source to feed my microbes? Well, when you look at it, this plant produces uh, photosynthates, and 20 to 60 percent of those photosynthates actually end up back in the rhizosphere uh, through the process of ex uh, ex uh, exuding it through that micro uh, mucogel. So this is no mistake, and this plant is spending a lot of energy to do that, so there's got to be a real purpose. So when you look at the mucogel, it's broken down, it's not by accident. This chemistry is very complicated, and this is just one page out of a document that talks about all different chemistries that, that actually is exuded by these plants. And the plant has the ability to change that, that concentration, that chemistry at any given time based on what it's looking for, if it has the resources to do that. In other words, if we feed the plant properly, the proper balance of nutrition, it can produce these compounds. If we don't, it struggles. So even though it's lost that phenotypic uh, ability to recognize these, these, uh, these microbes, and what we're doing and, and can do in production agriculture from our findings and what we saw on Dean Glenny's farm, we can give it a bit of a helping hand and, and, and reestablish some of that. So I met George on um, Jack's farm in 1984. He was doing work on uh, scab at that time, uh, way back in the time. And you know, I've been involved with George talking about all this kind of um, um, activity in soils. His whole career was, was looking at soil amendments and disease suppression and, and, and how, to, how, to, how to deal with disease in soils and pathogen and all that good stuff. And I don't know, when was this actually started, George? Back in 2004 or, or before that? You don't remember? <laughs> Anyhow, George and Sean Hemmingson with NRC thought that they would like to fingerprint all the microbes in soils around the world so they could come up with and be able to identify where the soil came from. So they did all this work sequencing all these different soils from around the world, and, and what they came up with was that all the soils had the same group of organisms. In different combinations, but every soil had the same complement of, of bugs, and some they didn't know what they looked like, but basically, or who they were, but um, they all had the same complement. So going back to this study, this is a study with George is doing on potatoes, looking for disease and particularly scab suppression of potatoes in, in both Ontario and PEI, two major um, potato growing regions in Canada. And this is uh, a, a shot of the organisms in the bulk soil from both Ontario and PEI. And you can see there's some similarities here, a little different pecking order and concentrations of these different things. Um, and then they looked at uh, the organisms in the rhizosphere, and you can see a bit of a shift here, a bit of a change. Uh, of what these organisms are doing and, and, and where they are in these two different uh, research plots. And then they looked at the organisms up inside the plant themselves in the root extracts. And, and this was a little bit uh, alarming uh, because here you can see that there's actually rhizobium in potatoes. What's a rhizobium doing in a potato? Uh, people ask the question. So why is rhizobium there and what is it actually doing? Well, since that time, <coughs> we've actually uh, identified what rhizobium does. Uh, it controls a lot of pathogens. It does a lot of things in plants to, to 
control disease and, and a number of different things. And that's just a, another page out of a research article on all the different things that rhizobium in plants does on different non-nodulating plants from insect control and, and nutrient uptake, disease suppression. But rhizobium does something else. It secretes a polysaccharide that aggregates soils. So when we talk about soil health, soil aggregation is one of the biggest things we look for. We talk about how can we aggregate these soils and how do we do that. We do it through reduced tillage is one. Uh, and basically, this rhizobium is really one of the beasts that puts out enough polysaccharide to aggregate these soils. This is a cross section of a barley root um, with soil particles stuck to it through that, that polysaccharide that these rhizobium are secreting. The rhizobium also, through this, this secretion of mucogel, increase water retention, water holding capacity of soils. They, they mineralize a lot of nutrients. Um, and like all the other, all their other buddies out there, one of the main functions that these microbes have in life is to convert inorganic phosphorus to ATP. Every cell on this planet needs ATP to survive. So that's what these microbes do. So going back to George's study in Ontario and PEI, you can see here, and we're just looking at a certain group of what classified as the good guys and the bad guys. And you can see in Ontario, there's a greater proportion of the good guys than there is in PEI. Same type of production system, same type of fertilizer practices. So you ask the question at this time, why is that? And this study was back, done back in the mid 2000s someplace, anyhow. Uh, why is Ontario soils different? Well, we started this company in, in, in Alliston, in the potato growing region that George is working in here. We had them introduced to low level liming, better fertility practices, overall just better, better agronomy to grow these potatoes. They're not quite at that level in PEI in this particular study. So we can make a difference. And as you're gonna see through the rest of these slides, we can make a difference on the percentage of these good productive organisms in these soils if we know what we're doing. Uh, out of that study, we did come up with some understanding how fertility could control, control scab. And in this study, we found out that we need to have some place between 0.3 and 0.4 of a K to magnesium ratio to make this happen. When I did this algorithm up back uh, 20 some years ago, I thought I was just having more efficient use of nitrogen because of that balance between potassium and magnesium. But we're finding out now that it has more to do than that. It's actually about the, the conversion of ATP. This is how every plant, every cell, uh, every organism on this planet actually converts inorganic phosphorus to a form of, of phosphorus that can plant, the plant, plant or cell can use and store as ATP. So this relationship between these two, these two nutrients is very critical uh, for, for overall um, plant or animal growth on the planet. This is just the results of that study and looking at uh, what came out of it. And, and everybody's concerned about pH being a scab problem. You can see here it has really no significance. Uh, the real significance was over application of potassium. Well, the potassium suppressed the magnesium that interfered with phosphate uptake because scab is actually a phosphate re related disorder. So a lot of times we look at these, look for these answers. You gotta kinda, kinda walk around the barn a little bit and figure out what's going on because it's not as clear as it might be. And that was published in 2007. So we get involved in biologicals. Um, <clears throat> when we started out uh, back in the early stages of ANL biologicals, we, we offered the Haney test. So that's what the Haney test looks like if you get it from our, our lab. Never had a lot of uptake on that. Um, I really couldn't make a recommendation based on that information because it really, really was no more than a calculation looking at the Solvita CO2 respiration and organic matter content in soils. So it really didn't encompass a whole bunch. Now Haney incorporated in his test, and I'll give him credit for this because he's the first one that started looking at it, nutrients. So he used, he, at least he used that in his overall recommendation for, uh, for cropping. <clears throat> so um, <clears throat> up until this point, George is working for the Agriculture Canada, and because we had the relationship we had for so many years, uh, I said, George, we really got to take this, this information to the, to the market. We got to be able to bring this to farmers. And he said, we're not ready. We don't have the equipment. We don't have the, the, the resources to do that. When we do, I'll come to you and we'll, we'll do something about it. So in 2009, I think it was, we decided to pull the trigger. Uh, George uh, retired for the first time and come on board with us at a and Biologicals, and that's where we started. So the initiative here was to find out what these microbes, uh, what they are, who's populating the host, 
uh, and how is the host actually selecting these microbes? So you know, how is that happening? Uh, what is it, what is the, how is the host responding to them? So what is it doing for the host? Uh, and what is the unique thing that these microbes offer? What are they doing and, and what are they doing to enhance this, this, this growth? And then again, how is this plant actually maintaining, or as Dr. White said, how is this plant actually cultivating uh, these organisms? So in our studies, we look at everything. We look at chemistry, and I've, I've told um, Soledad and her group, you're going out in the field, we're spending days and days and days and losing all those students. Um, we, we, need to, we, meet, we need to get all we can out of it, because we can't go back and get the information after the fact. So analyze everything. Do herbicide uh, residuals, do tissue samples, do nitrate tests, just analyze everything. We may never use it all, but um, at least we have it. So that's the kind of thing we're doing, mineralogy, chemistry, biology, putting that all together to come up with some answers. When we first started out here and started you know, biologicals, um, George said to me, he said, my whole career I've looked at sick soils and sick plants. I think we need to refocus and let's find the healthiest plants we can find, the most disease suppressive soils we can find any place on the planet, and let's see why they're different. And fortunately, we had somebody right in their backyard, Dean Glenny, and he was, he was more than happy to work with us. And uh, Solid already talked about his less than conventional way of farming. Uh, but he was doing things right. But what we have to keep in mind, uh, when I said to Dean, just excuse me for a second, I asked him how long did it take to get a field from less productive to where he is today in, in overall productivity. He said about five years. I think Soledad referred to that earlier. So I said, well, where do you get your fertility recommendations? He says, from you guys. I always have. When you come to my seminars, I talk about raising optimum levels and balancing out what you can in the soil in, in three to five years to take it from a low to a medium or medium to good. Uh, so it'd take you 15 to 20 years, also, which was mentioned today in, in most production systems. Dean is putting that recommendation I give for the, that three to five year increase in a third of the acre. So he's 3x in his recommendations to do that. Not nitrogen, mind you, just everything else. So he's really pushing things. So as we've worked together for so long, George and I, we've agreed to disagree for a long time on disease and nutrition. But first year in, uh, George recognized that if the soil pH is around 6.5, we had the most biological activity. Well, that makes sense because we also have the most nutrient availability and that's just kind of the happy place for most plants. Um, so uh, things start looking and pointing in the direction that there might be a piece of the puzzle, there might be something we can do here. You looked at this diversity puzzle here that uh, Soledad shared with you and how diverse the, the population is in the, the bulk soil and how that changed as the plant started to manipulate the rhizosphere. Another thing that we have kind of got confused is that we believe that everything in life and everything in a system, the more diverse things are, the better. Plant doesn't think so because the plant's going to change that diversity as you already saw. Uh, it likes to have a big pool of fish from but it only wants a certain fish. So it's going it's to select uh, from this diverse pool of organisms uh, what it wants to go forward. And as we talk about our soil health index and manipulating that, as I'm going to show you here, we want to change that. Now, if the plant does not have the resources to change that population or select the population it has, it can't feed everybody. So it doesn't even get started. So the reason why in Hessel's field that didn't change right through the growing season to any d big degree was the plant just didn't have the resources to do that. Remember the plant's feeding and cultivating and if it doesn't have the resources to do the proper job it just, it just we found just didn't start. And Soledad also showed you this slide looking at how diverse Hessel's field was, a non-productive field, compared to Glenny's field. So there's, there's some real selection going on here and just how's the plant doing that. Well, we are fortunate enough, I, I get a chance once in a while, Soledad lets me play with her technicians, and we sit down and look at the data. And one of our technicians put this together in a project that George had, and we started looking at the data, and, and I might be reading things into this a little bit, because we don't have a lot of database, but as we go back and look at it more and more all the time, we see these sorts of things. And when our soil health index is very low, that's this number here, we don't see a lot of things happening. But as the soil health index starts to increase, 
we see the plant start to accumulate all kinds of bacillus. Goes from about 10 to the 4, 10 to the 5, up to 10 to the 7th bacillus in, into the rhizosphere. And once, once the, the soil health index in these other fields is up here, we see the bacillus start to drop back down, and now we see an increase in rhizobium and pseudomonas. The theory here is that the plant is signaling because it knows that the environment's getting better. It, it's, it's, its environment is living is getting better. It has more reserves and more, more resources to cultivate these things, and it calls in the army, calls in the bacillus that actually can be quite toxic to clean up the neighborhood. It's going to kick out the riffraff. And once it does that, it, it then goes down and just kind of um, stays there to protect the neighborhood at a level that the plant can tolerate, and then it allows the good guys to populate and come into the neighborhood. So it's kind of neat to watch this, uh, but, it, but it's happening, and it, this is some of the transitions we see. So year, year one, we had fantastic results. We saw all kinds of neat things happening. And we look at Dean Glenny's field, and those who have been through my seminars, you know that that's a pretty decent looking soil test. And you know, we look at his balance of his cations, we look at his phosphate levels, everything looks really nice. His P saturations, a little bit on the high side, but still well within the range we'd like to see. And his K to magnesium, K to magnesium ratio is right in the sweet spot. So everything's working in this field. So, you know, and this is before we started putting it together, he said, there's, there's something going on here. So we look and compare the second year. And the second year, George said to me, he says, things aren't quite as good. We might have maybe jumped the gun in our, our thinking on, on how this works. Um, he said, the, the microbial population is not nearly as, as aggressive as it was. Well, happened to pick a part, a field, a part of the field of Glenny's fields that wasn't quite as, quite as well balanced. Our, our K to mag wasn't where it was, our phosphorus was a little bit lower. But when we compare that to Hessel's field, there's a big difference. And we look at the soil health index differences, again, there's a significant difference between the two. So although Glenny's is still in a, in a fairly good condition, it wasn't as good as the, the spot the year before. So it had a little less activity. A um, lot of focus on um, CO2 respiration and microbial respiration in soils. Uh, we are the distributor for Agdea, um, not Agdea, Solvita cat test kit in, in Ontario and in Canada. Um, so we do a lot of this, and matter of fact, another thing that every one of Soledad's tests, she'd run Solvita on, so we do CO2 respiration on everything. And in the early stages of being supplier of this, I had a customer call me and ask me, he says, do these things actually have a best before date? And I said, well, I don't think so. Uh, why would you ask? He said, well, I bought some kits from you, and I went out and tested my sand field with lower organic matter, and I tested my heavier soil with higher organic matter, and I would have expected the CO2 respiration on the sands to be much lower than the, than the heavy, heavier clays. And he said, that did, I didn't find that. And I really couldn't answer that at that time. But over the number of years that we've been doing these trials, we've been, te we've been testing uh, a respiration. This is Glenny's field, and this is Hessel's. When you look at the organic matter in Glenny's, he's at 3.1. He's got, uh, what's that, 67 CO2 respiration. Hessel's at 7.8, at, at 58, 59. There's another one of Hessel's at 6, 6, and 63. And there's Glenny at 2.9 and, and 70 CO2 respiration. So CO2 respiration does not necessarily give you a good indicator of the right microbial uh, activity. In this case, uh, it's not even correlating to organic matter, which we would have expected. So, when we look at just looking at respiration, it may not be giving us a whole answer. Uh, results of, of Dean's field, we talked about efficiency of, of nutrient use and how this becomes effective to us. Again, I asked, I asked Dean, how much nitrogen do you think you're using per bushel of corn production on your farm? And without even thinking, he said 0 0.9. 0 0.9 pounds of N per bushel. So he's using, did somebody say something? No? He's using 0 0.9 pounds of N per bushel and he did the math, I don't know how he did the math, but when I calculate how much this corn needs for 300 bushel of corn, um, he's only using 205 pounds of additional nitrogen, I'm including uh, 30 pounds of um, potential mineralizable nitrogen from the organic matter on his farm. So that's 0 0.8 to 0 0.9 pounds per bushel of nitrogen that's available to that crop, or he's using on that crop. Hessel, at 150 to 260 bushel, is putting on 190 pounds, coming back with another 42 pounds, uh, they have 6.5% organic matter on the average, so let's say another 60 pounds of mineralizable nitrogen for a total of 1.8 pounds of nitrogen per bushel. So you can see the power 
of the endophytes producing nitrogen on, on Glenny's field compared to Hessel's. And you can, see, you can see where this can take us. And you know, I'm not trying to scare the fertilizer people in the room. We're still going to use fertilizer, but we're going we're to do a better job with it. You can also see here from the data that we have a spike in nitric concentration in, in Glenny's field at this stage, but it drops down to nothing at harvest. And there's nothing left in the drains, there's nothing left over. In, in this case, we've got all kinds of environmental concerns with available nitrogen in, in the soil and possibly going to groundwater. So th this is the right move. It's the efficient way to go. And you're going to see from other stuff here, it's, it's the way we have to go for the, the quality of the crops that we're looking for. So we say, in theory, if this can happen, why aren't plants doing it today? These are indigenous organisms. We just take them out of the ground and, and clean them up a little bit and, and put them in pails at 10 to the 8th and sell them back and put them back. Um, so in theory, this should be happening all by itself. Well, it is. Weeds, weeds do not need um, fertilizer to grow, right? Everybody got any problem growing weeds? Works pretty good? Well, when you look at the efficiency of use, uh, we're just comparing some micronutrients here, of weeds versus some of the plants we grow, I mean, you're 4x efficiency uh, on, on, on a weed compared to some of the crops we're growing. So it is all about the chemistry, and understanding the chemistry, I think, can help us understand how we can move forward to be a, have a more productive system or a sustainable system. We also found that potassium plays a real role in that whole re, uh, redeposit, uh, redeposit uh, of the, the sucrose into the rhizosphere and just uh, it, it correlates to strongly to almost everything these bugs are doing. So again, this is uh, where we, we go with this. We go to the fields, we, we pull samples out of the fields, collect all those samples. This is another, another uh, NDVI from our, our cameras, or our, our algorithms. And you can see there's a lot more uh, definition in these. So again, allowing us to go in and, and pick out the real, the real important spots. We've had a lot of people use drones uh, in their field um, plots. Um, I don't know, maybe they got lost, maybe their technicians weren't tall enough, they got lost in the field, but they really didn't find the right locations, and we, we see that in the yield differences coming out. So you saw a slide like this on Solidad slides, uh, again, comparing every nutrient, everything, everything we compare to yield, and we keep saying yield. Uh, at a &L, right from the start, we never ever focused on yield, we focus on quality. We believe yield comes with quality. So. Uh, when we talk about yield, we're talking about yield and quality of the crop. Uh, this is another one looking at nitrate, nitrogen, and, and potassium response in soils to, to increase uh, microbial activity. We look at soil reactive carbon, which is also on our new test, uh, a good indicator and a very valuable tool in looking at soil health because it, it responds very quickly. If you change something on your farm and you have a baseline of soil, uh, the, the soil active carbon, and you change something, you can go back and retest it and see if you've had a positive or negative response very quickly. Um, this one bothers everybody, and Solid had already talked about that. Uh, really no response or no significant correlation to yield, um, and, and we would think that it has a big, res big response, but that's not just our data. There's the data from a number of labs in the U.S. Um, that, that look at organic matter relationships to yield, so everybody's finding the same thing. So we can't completely discount organic matter because it does a lot of things. And one thing it really does in overall productivity is it retains moisture. These microbes need moisture to perform. 2016 showed us that. We had a 60% correlation to microbial and yield on that year because it was dry. So organic matter plays a major role in, in a lot of uh, soil stability and tilth and also moisture retention. So we look at our results and we start comparing these results to the yields. Um, our total plate count here, we start seeing some significance in things that we can control. Um, anything with over 0.5 is significant. You can see our GFI, our general fertility index in the rhizosphere, strong correlation. Potassium, as I mentioned before, a real strong correlation. And we're looking at total plate count here. Not so much nitrogen. And we actually have a lot of uh, tests that show us that nitrogen it has a, negative, a very negative response. Our bulk soil GFI, uh, again, fairly strong response. This one uh, took me off guard a little bit. Uh, good response to boron, and I'll show you why in a few minutes. Uh, response to background phosphates, but this was only one group of organisms. Keep in mind, all these organisms, their main goal is to solubilize phosphates and make phosphates more available to the plant. Uh, so 
A little bit of a surprise to see this one. And then that K to magnesium ratio, very strong correlation in overall activity. So we start breaking it down by, by organism. This is Pseudomonas. Pseudomonas loves fertility. It loves lots of potassium, lots of calcium. Uh, this is the one that correlated to phosphorus. Even though that this particular organism is crazy at, at solubilizing phosphate, it says Soledad told me one day it's the weak sister. It, it likes to stay in the five star. It wants things really, really nice, uh, and then it'll perform. So we see that response to this one. It does solubilize phosphates very aggressively. It produces a lot of uh, antibiotics. It does a lot of great things. It produces some of these polysaccharides I talked about as well. Uh, but it needs, it needs a little more TLC for it to, to perform. Rhizobium, again, uh, we see a, a real response in, in, to rhizobium to fertility, and particularly potassium. This one responds a little bit to, to nitrogen in the profile. Uh, again, the GFI. This is the one that responded strongly to the boron. Well, that makes sense. Nodulating rhizobium need boron as well. Um, so things are starting to add up here. But you know, when you start looking at this, we had some of those report cards I showed you earlier. And I went back to Savita, who, who, who did some of this, these analyses, and said, well, how come um, that potash is, that, that rhizobium is not as high in these results as it should be? with the potash levels the way and the, and the GFI the way it is, and the K to mag that, that correlates very strongly to rhizobium. And then we look at, you know, look at this relationship with boron. I said, go back and look at the data and compare rhizobium in, in the plants to boron in the soil. She said, well, I didn't do that because the data showed us and you told us that all our boron levels are low. We're 0.2 to 0.9 in our soils. I said, yes, but let, let's just have a look. And you saw this slide already. Uh, Soledad showed you this. And going from 0.2 to 0.9, we see a significant increase in rhizobia in, in, the, in the, both the rhizosphere and the plant when our boron levels get higher, both in the, in the, uh, the uh, bulk soil and the, in the rhizosphere. This is the one that really surprised me. Um, and this is, uh, this is just recent, um, 2017 data. This is looking at the relationship of zinc, copper, and boron in this case. Boron tissue levels to be optimum should be in the 19 to 20, uh, 20 ppm range. Um, most tissue results we get in, in Ontario, boron is deficient. But look what happens here. As we increase in yield, look what our plant tissue boron levels do. Now what is astonishing about this is there's no boron in the fertilizer program and we're trying to figure out where this is coming from. I think the plant is sending out a signal saying, I've got this big yield potential and I've got the power to do this. I don't have enough boron. So I want a signal for a organism that can solubilize boron. So we're pulling these soils apart to see if we can find out that little beast and see what, what he's doing. But I have no other answer to this. And that's a significant response in high yield situations. And the boron levels are the same in all cases. Yes? <laughs> Point 0.9 to point 0.2 was... Point the first time I've ever heard you say it quite like this. Those soils did not have boron, and we did not apply boron. You don't know where it came from. There, there's unavailable boron in all soils. I mean, we measure available boron. Um, I, my suspicion is the plant's responding to that. Don't know. It's just a theory. But you explain that. It's not just one field. It, and it... It tracks yield pretty, pretty darn close. Is that, is that pH related at all? No. We can't, we, we, we've tried to analyze it and figure out where the connect is and it's just not there. We have low boron levels in soils. When our yields go up, our plant tissue goes up. Okay? So we look at other things and try to understand, you know, how are these organisms performing and what are they doing? Um, this fall we had a real problem with the fusarium in fields in Don. Uh, I told the researchers uh, that I worked with, uh, Savit in this case, to go out and, and take a soil sample from a couple of fields that we can compare. Uh, these fields here, you can see, had very little fusarium. This field was loaded. So why is that? So we analyzed the different parameters in the field. We see direct correlation to these certain soil nutrients and um, 
and fusarium infestation. So that's making some sense to us. And again, boron shows up pretty strong, but also calcium. Then we look at the residual chemistry. And we look at residual chemistry, and someplace around 75 parts per billion of this residual chemistry, we start seeing an increase in fusarium. These fields and this field have the same herbicide program for the same length of time. No residual herbicide to speak of in this field, both in the, the bulk salt and the rhizosphere salt, significant amount in that field. So I asked her when she went out there, I said, if there's any tissue around the area you're sampling, because this is, this is after harvest, well, I want some grain, I want some soil, and I want some tissue from that area, bring some in, let's analyze it. We found a correlation to boron levels in tissue and, and residual, residual, residual herbicides. So these soils here are breaking down the herbicide. This one isn't. There's an organism in these soils that is activated and breaking down the herbicide. How are we stimulating that? And that's what we're trying to find out now because that relationship to the residual herbicide, that residual herbicide, I'm not going to tell anybody what it is, but it kills or doesn't kill the pseudomonas that kills fusarium, but it denatures the pseudomonas so it does, no longer produces the antibiotic to kill the fusarium. Okay? And we've isolated that. So we know there's something going on here. Now we have to figure out how we get rid of this. So one person asked the question, how, does, how do herbicides affect your microbial population? This is one place, uh, but I'll show you another chart here in a minute that kind of explains that. So microbial diversity is good to have uh, as kind of the pond to feed from, but the plant doesn't want that because it just does not have enough carbon source to feed everybody. So it's selective in bringing the right, the right bugs into the rhizosphere so it basically can feed those, those bugs. These endophytes have specific carbon source requirements that they're looking for, and there's a lot of competition for these. So uh, that's why we, th we think the plant is doing this selection. Um, green manures are cover crops. Anybody deal with them? Are they good, bad? What's the best one? That's the million dollar question, because everybody asks, I always phone it up and say, what should I use? Well, the man that I've talked to is right there. He's done the most work on cover crops and green manures and significance and performance. Any green cover works. And the reason is pretty simple. If we're saying that the plant is feeding the microbes and keeping the microbial population healthy, and we've got a crop that's feeding them, and you also heard Soledad say these populations increase in the plant until just about senescence, and we see it drop back down to diversity, the diverse population, or in other words, the plant no longer can maintain the population it wants. We harvest that crop, there's nothing feeding those microbes. You put a green cover in there, you're feeding the microbes. Okay? Maybe that's too simplified, but I think that makes sense. So what have we learned? It is about the chemistry. How do we understand it? Well, we're starting to get some understanding of it. We're, we're still moving forward on that. We really don't understand the micronutrient response as much as I'd like, because all our micronutrient levels on our plots are too low. Uh, so we've got a lot of work to do yet. Um, this is a slide of a soil um, that is a good soil and a poor, a poor soil. Um, our technicians have put together a consortia of organisms that can actually change that, that uh, poor soil into a good soil. Bugs in a jug. But this is where we're going. These bugs in a jug inoculants, if anybody's ever used them, you see a real green up at first. And it looks like everything's going to look really promising. But less, less than 20% will go to harvest. And that's because, these, remember, these bugs are already there. And the plant's not cultivating them. So we're putting them on as an inoculum. And if you don't feed the plant to help the plant cultivate the bugs in the jug that you just applied, they don't live to harvest. So they, leave their, they lose their, their efficacy. So I think the technology is, is real. I think the technology is going to be the future. I, I strongly believe that. But we have to change the whole way we look at agriculture today and how we farm our, our crops. We've got to think about that relationship between the plant and the soil and the, micro, the microbiome and, 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 and help this plant basically cultivate these bugs. So that is real. Uh, it stands, stands golden. Uh, anybody who's ever tried this, this uh, particular soil health test, I've seen that. Um, 
We've simplified the test because when we first come out with this understanding of soil health and microbes, it was about taking your soil and your, your tissue test at 60 or 40, 40 or 50 days in, send it to the lab and we'll analyze it and, and tell you what's there. Well, nobody likes to go out and do soil sampling in, in that time of year because everybody's fishing, right? Uh, so we really didn't get a lot of take, take, uptake to that. And again, the, the cost of doing that was very expensive. So we went back and looked at, well, can we put together, based on the knowledge we have in, in how these, these bugs respond to nutrition, and come up with a, a sample, a simpler system, to give us some kind of clue on how we can, we can manage these fields. Just before I leave this slide, I want to talk a little bit about herbicides. This, is another, this isn't part of our soil health test. This will cost you about 300 bucks to do this test. And I don't really recommend it because we know what's going on. But when we look at residual herbicides, and this is a good news, bad news story, and answers that one gentleman's question earlier. Um, there is one group of herbicides we've been using for quite some time that when we see it in, in, the, in, the, in the profile, we give it kind of a 90 percentile impact on the microbes. There's another group of herbicides that we've used for a long time that have an impact on the microbes, not nearly as strong. We give it a kind of a 25% in, in our algorithm. Um, all the rest don't matter. All the rest really aren't causing any grief to these microbes from, from what we've seen so far. Uh, so yes, we've got to be concerned about these things. That's why we're interested in trying to find out the secret sauce to stimulate these bugs to break this residual herbicide down, because it is causing an impact. But the stronger your soil health index here is, the less of a problem that is. So the healthier this microbial population is, and the more we're feeding these bugs, the faster they're breaking down these herbicides, and the less of an impact they have, uh, the herbicides have on the organisms. So just dumbing this down as much as we can, um, when you look at your soil health index and you want to improve your soil health index and improve your microbial activity, we've got CO2 respiration on here, we've got reactive carbon, so these two look really good. Again, we can't put a lot of, a lot of uh, merit in the CO2 respiration because we're looking at all microbial uh, respiration activities here, so it doesn't really classify for us strong. But when you look at uh, these ranges here, if one of these things are outside the optimum range, just simply moving one of these will move this needle. And the reason we, we want to look at that is that's something we can do. I mean, that's something we can, we can physically do and have an impact on. And we can also look at you know, things like percent saturation of phosphorus. Uh, in this particular case, I have a soil health index of 49, which is pretty darn good. Uh, but I, I suspect that in this soil we have a uh, good rhizobium population because of the balance there. Uh, we have probably a good selection of bacillus that we need. But I would suspect that our pseudomonas population is less than ideal because the phosphate levels are lower than they should be. Probably have some because overall fertility is pretty good. But if we move that needle a little bit, again, we're at increased pseudomonas. So we can look at that soil test, and I can pretty well tell you, you know, are you rich in pseudomonas, rhizobium, nitrogen fixtures, who's there? So it does give us a pretty good indication based on, based on the, the work that we've done. Uh, on our report, if you're really hung up on Haney, we also offer the Haney test and Haney information for those who have been using it. So you can get both on a report. They don't always agree um, as far as your, your uh, report card. So we look at... Look at um, questions I've had from, from the industry. Um, we're in southwestern Ontario. We've presented this all across Canada. And we've got people in areas of Canada say, well, you know, we, we are up here next to the tundra, and it really don't, we can't, can't work for us. Uh, so I said, well, send this one in. This is from just outside of Vanderhoof. That's way up there. I mean, I think the trees are this high up there. I'm not sure I've been there. Um, that's the highest. Soil health index I've ever seen. So uh, it works everywhere. Uh, this, is a, this is something else we've got to pay attention to in basic understanding of agronomy. This is a guy who sent a couple samples to me, and he got back to me and said, I think your soil health index is flipped because it, it doesn't work here. This is a good test, and he's got a 45, well, this is his poor test, or poor, field, poor producing field, and he's got a 45 uh, index. And this is, this is the one he said is good, and he's at 39. But if you look at the data here, the good one has a pH of 6, poor one has a pH of 5. These organisms, the bacteria we're talking about, do not like acid soils. You get much below 5,5 five and they start to die off. So although we, they, they, they are still kind of surviving here, 
Plants don't like 5,5 pH, so we're seeing lower productivity just because plant growth is, is reduced. So when we look at this type of thing, um, you, you've got to also taken account, although the calcium and pH is in part of the, the algorithm and index, uh, it doesn't, it, it's, it's not that strong that it would override this. So you've got to pay attention to some of the basic agronomy when you read these results. Right? So that's just the good and bad. I mentioned that because it, it came up. So I put this talk on in, in, at uh, Manitoba Ag Days uh, to a group of farmers, and just, just again, showing people where we're at, similar to today. And we had a, a grower in the, in the room, unbeknown to us, from North Dakota. He went home, uh, he had already harvested his grain, went to all his production areas and took a soil health test and sent it to us. And this is the results. He called us up and showed us. And he said, your, your soil health index correlated to my yields 100%. And again, he did it the next year, and in his area, a dry year, but again, a very close correlation to, to his yields with those indexes. So we, we see that it's working. We, we know that it's working. Have we got a lot to do yet? Absolutely. But at least we got something that we can use in the production system that's, that's starting to move us the right direction. And it's helping us understand uh, things that we can do with soil health. And you know, a lot of people have models and report cards out there about counting earthworms and you know, aggregate stability. Well, aggregate stability is all about soil health and what these microbes are doing. And the earthworms came after the bacteria. So the fact that you've got lots of earthworms means that you probably have a healthy soil, uh, but that's not where it started. So we need to pay attention to how do we get from here to here and what are the tools we can use to do that.